right, you guys, let's pick it up where we left off. We introduced uh, the hyperbolic functions. I haven't really done anything with them yet. Let's move on to this example. So you're gonna see some of these uh, prove a hyperbolic identity. So one of the uh, ways that these are really closely associated with the trig functions is that there are lots and lots of identities that go along with the hyperbolic functions. We're not really gonna spend much time on this. Obviously our goal is to do derivatives and that sort of thing in this course, but we wanna recognize them. Um, and that lets us see just kind of where the name comes from and some interesting properties. So we're gonna prove this identity here uh, that cosh 2x would equal cosh squared x plus cinch squared x. Okay, let me jump to my paper here. Prove the identity. Okay. We're trying to prove that cosh 2x equals cosh squared x plus cinch squared x. In order to do this, um, you know, there's, there's definitely more than one way, but the most straightforward way to do it to say, okay, um, whichever side I choose to begin with, I'm gonna go back to the definition of cosh and cinch with all of the E's. So what I wanna do is I wanna pick the more complex side. Here, the more complex side would be the right side. I wanna take the more complex side and I wanna work with it, do a bunch of algebra until I get the simpler side. Okay, so I'm going to, let's say, simplify the complex side to equal the simpler side. And to do that, I'm going to use the definition of cosh x and cinch x. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to start again that. And over here, cosh squared x plus cinch squared x. So cosh squared x is e to the x plus e to the negative x over two, and that gets squared, plus, and then cinch x, e to the x minus e to the negative x over two, that gets squared. Okay, so I'm just gonna work with this, simplify it, multiply it out, right? Maybe combine some fractions together, and hopefully it just, works out to be exactly that, and it should. Okay, let's see. I'm going to begin by squaring the top and the bottom, but I'm going to do that in a couple of steps. Let me just write this out for now, squared over four. Squaring top and bottom. Same thing here. Square, and that's over four. Okay. Now to square out these numerators. This is kind of interesting. So think of it foiling. Um, e to the x plus e to the negative x times itself. Maybe I'll kind of like do that over here on the side. Because there's something happens here that's kind of cool. So e to the x times e to the x, e to the 2x, right? We add exponents e to the x times e to the negative x, we're going to add exponents, but notice e plus x plus negative x is plus e to the zero. Same thing with the inside plus e to the zero. And then finally plus e to the negative 2x. Well, what is e to the zero? It's one. So this would be e to the 2x plus one plus one plus two. And that's how it would multiply out. Okay, so all of this right here, e to the 2x plus 2 plus e to the negative 2x, and that's over 4. Something similar here. Notice we're subtracting, so that's going to work out ah, e to the 2x minus 2 plus e to the negative 2x. that a little bit clearer. 
e to the 2x when we FOIL. And because of the negative, we're subtracting both those in the middle. And OK. Doing well. Notice they both have a denominator of 4. That's awesome. We can combine them together. OK, how's that going to work? e to the 2x plus e to the 2x. 2e to the 2x. The 2s cancel, right? e to the negative 2x, e to the negative 2x, plus 2e to the negative 2x over 4. So far, so good. Everything has a multiple of 2. We can divide 2 from each term and arrive at this. And at this point, we've got it. Notice this is exactly the definition of cosh x, except we've got two x's there instead of x. And so this is cosh 2x. And it's proven. Okay, pretty cool. So again, the strategy always go back to the definitions of cosh and cinch, and then obviously start with the more complex side uh, and go from there. Okay. Moving on. Let's note that there are um, a lot more hyperbolic identities. Let me mention just the basic ones. Again, we're not going to really dwell on this a lot, but um, I like to just sort of unpack and explain where do we get the name hyperbolic? Why are these the hyperbolic functions? What's the connection to the hyperbola? So it turns out we need to um, know these basic hyperbolic identities to make sense of that, especially the first one. Check that out. It turns out cosh squared x minus cinch squared x equals 1. Uh, that wouldn't be too difficult to prove. You could prove it in a very similar way that we just proved this last identity. And you notice the similarity between the original trig identity, cosh squared x plus, or excuse me, cosine squared x plus sine squared x equals 1. We just have that, uh, what was a plus sign in the middle now is a minus. And then these other two would follow from it, 1 minus one minus tanj squared x equals sesh squared x, and koth squared x minus one equals cosesh squared x. Um, and we could get these pretty easily from the first one. You know, here, if we divide everything by cosh squared x, that would produce what we see in that second one. We get the third one if we start with the original and divide everything by cinch squared x. We could produce that dividing by cinch squared, dividing by cinch squared. OK, exactly the same thing you do with the, uh, the Pythagorean identities in trig. Why the name hyperbolic functions? OK, let's focus on that first basic identity, cosh squared x minus cinch squared x equals 1. And if you think back um, to your algebra days when you first learned about hyperbolas, the general hyperbola had this form that you see right there. Uh, the H and the K are where the hyperbola is centered. The A and the B tell you how to move horizontally and vertically if you wanted to graph that hyperbola. They kind of give the boundaries just on how wide or how uh, narrow the two branches of the hyperbola would be. Uh, it turns out there is a unit hyperbola Right, so in trig, we study the unit circle, but there's a unit hyperbola as well. Maybe you never thought about it. Uh, if you make the center at zero, zero, and you make both values of A and B equal to one, you'll get the unit hyperbola. X squared minus Y squared equals one. Now, check out the similarity between our hyperbolic identity and our unit hyperbola. Here's the graph, kind of tie it all together. Here's the graph of that unit hyperbola. 
right? It'd have vertices at one and negative one. It would open up horizontally because the x squared comes first. If you remember um, how that all works. Any point on your hyperbola on either branch could be described as cosh t comma cinch t with the x coordinate and the y coordinate. If you tell me a value of t and I plug it into cosh and I plug it into cinch, that x coordinate and y coordinate would be a point on the unit hyperbola. That's pretty incredible. Um, or you could even think like, well, if that's like the X value and that's the Y, if we plug those in for X and Y, that would be exactly our identity, just using the variable T. Obviously, we don't want to repeat the X and Y because we're already using them here. Here's even more connection. So there's the connection to the hyperbola. Here's even more connection to the trig, right? The trig, we studied the unit circle. A unit circle has the equation x squared plus y squared equals one. And any point on that circle, you could think of the x coordinate as cosine t, the y coordinate as sine t. Tell me a value of t, and you could plug it into the cosine and the sine, and that would end up being that those x, y would end up being a point on the circle. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, let's stop this video here. Up next, we're going to talk about the derivatives. Finally, 